Hi, everybody. So this is the motor sizing seminar. There's a couple of documents. If you go to, um, there's a document called um, for better uh, motor sizing. Um, there might be introduction to motor sizing and it's on the California Mechatronics Center website. If you go into the technical documents, um, I'm going to be referring to this a few times but it's also something that you can use after we're done because you're not going to be motor sizing experts by the time we're done. So let's start out with motion control. What are the, the formulas that you got to solve? Why is, why is this tricky at all to, to do? Other than designing in the mechanics and the gear ratios, I think that you guys could actually use your existing tools to know what gear ratios do to torque and speed, how they affect that. Um, the hard part comes in by remembering to include all the key parts um, of a system. And they're not always all important, but they're almost always all worth thinking about. So here's what I mean. So um, we're going to write a peak torque. We're going to call it are the peak torque you need in the system. And I'm gonna give you kind of the overall formula. Um, and now I'm kind of starting through the seven steps of motor sizing and selection, if you will. Peak torque, the, the four key terms that you gotta consider. Um, most, well, I'm not even gonna say there's a most of the time what, what people do. I'm just gonna give them to you because they, they change. First one, torque to accelerate. Um, this is acceleration, accelerating the inertia. And so if I went back and I looked at, for instance, this, this uh, here, when you think of what are the inertias that are accelerated, that you have to accelerate, and you have to accelerate them and decelerate them. Um, it takes energy to do both. So think about all the inertias that you'd have to account for in a system like this. How many are there? Well, one, the mass, right? Which is kind of a weird because mass isn't inertia, we know that. And besides that, how does this mass end up as an inertia back at the motor? Well, I'll show you in a minute. That's one of the tricky things is how does the mass moving linearly show up as an inertia to the motor? But we got to calculate it. That has mass, that is spinning. There's our first spinning thing, that has inertia. Um, that has inertia, that has inertia. The shafting of that has inertia, coupler does, and the motor shaft does. So what was that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven terms that you would have in this equation. Torque peak for the torque to accelerate. And you'll notice it's not a plus or minus on this. It's always positive. You always need it. The other stuff is going to coast to stops and give us energy back. But th this one here, it's a positive torque. If you want to accelerate an inertia, you got to supply torque. So that one, just this term alone is based on um, torque is what? Inertia times angular acceleration, right? Yeah. So that term is I alpha and alpha is pretty easy to get. Alpha was right here. Sir, it was, it was this, that's alpha. So there is alpha, the slope of that curve. That's our acceleration rate. Okay. So, um, we, we have this, that's kind of easy to get from the motion profile. You do a little bit of kinematic formula, you know, what do you want it to do? Boom, there you get out, you solve for alpha in the, in the formulas based on the other things that you have. I don't know which ones you have. You'll know when you get there kind of thing. What's the customer tell you the max speed is? Well, I don't know, how long do we have to make the move? Uh, three seconds, okay. We gotta get to max speed in three seconds. You solve for alpha, not too hard. That's the tough one figure out what are these inertias. And I'll come back to that and show you kind of how to, 
a method to get to those. You can take a stab at it, but it's kind of hard. The rest of this stuff is, is pretty easy. That's the hard thing about motor sizing. Um, okay, plus or minus. The next thing you gotta keep taking into account is torque due to friction. There's nothing magic about this term. This is pure physics. Okay, do you have a friction coefficient? If you have a friction coefficient, what force does it take to, and, and this, uh, probably the, this is one of the things that I would caution you, pay close attention to vectors. You've got, when you draw these diagrams and when you have, when you have a, a system and you want me to check your sizing, really, the, the, I'm not ever gonna check your math. You guys can do math. Um, but what I will do is I'll look at your sketch of your system and I'll compare it to the formulas that you wrote that model that system. And for instance, you know, the torque due to friction in order for us to look at and write the formulas, you've got to actually get out, do, go back to that free body diagram and start to draw where, which direction is the force vector in, where's the load, and you got to get these vectors correct. I've seen it, I bet you 70% of the errors that I see in motor sizing are, they just drew some stuff and didn't quite connect the diagram to the formulas and the vector was in the completely wrong direction and was irrelevant or completely relevant depending on which which way they did it so this is really important and it seems to come up mostly in friction because you got the force and the normal force and and sine thetas and angles and slopes so you got to mess with those things you've all done that stuff you may have not done it for a while but you've got to go back to your physics book and remember chapter two, I think it was, of, of first physics, right? Okay, um, plus or minus. So far we've had friction working against us to accelerate, probably friction, friction helping you to decelerate, right? Thus the plus or minus part of this. Some, you know, you, you almost have to look at every single section of the motion profile to see what's the worst case torque that you're gonna need. So that's why this is a plus or minus is because sometimes it helps you, sometimes it hurts you. Okay. We have inertias that are just there. They, they're, they're, that's the mechanical mechanisms you have to get rotating to make the, the mechanics move. You have some external frictions sometimes, sometimes you don't, sometimes friction is zero and you get to say it's zero. Next one, torque due, to, torque due to gravity. As soon as you start to go vertical, you now have inertias that you're turning. There may be friction, but if you're going vertical, it requires extra torque because um, alpha equals 1G. So you've got a force pushing down and, it, and it's basically MG some, most of the time, but you've got to figure out, all right, what's gravity doing? How much force is it putting on it? And let me go back to that, that page. Let me, let's say that it was this page here and I oriented this whole thing vertically. And now this mass is moving vertically. If that's moving up and down, the inertia is all we're taking care of in the inertia term. The friction, if there was, if there happened to be friction down here somewhere, the friction was still there, but maybe the friction isn't there because if the mass was providing the friction, that term might've gone away. And all of a sudden it might not have been there because the friction the friction coat was, was here. That was, you know, torque due to friction. As soon as you go to vertical, 
Well, there isn't an MG anymore. There is slightly because of some, some twisting motion, but it's, it's not really there. So all of a sudden, we've got a gravity term that you have to deal with. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's zero. Um, mostly that is the same thing. It's like looking at where the forces are, making sure you're dealing with the right vectors, and then seeing how they translate back through some mechanisms. Okay, uh, last thing. Oops. Um, I'm going to call this torque to do work. You could call this other. You could call this um, thrust torque. But in general, what it, what it is, is it means that at some point, sometimes you're doing, you're not just moving the mass, the mass is doing some work. For instance, let's say you've got a robotic arm and the robotic arm has inertia, you're moving it around. It may have some friction in the mechanisms, probably not a lot of friction. Um, it does move, you know, you probably have some vertical motion depending on if you're doing that axis or, or this axis. But let's say you need to slide something out here. You need to slide, a, a, a move it from here to here. That's the action. Or you're painting, or um, you are sanding, or grinding, and you're moving something back and forth now. So which term accounted for the final motion that, of the work that you need to do? Well, it wasn't the inertia, because that didn't change. The friction probably has to do more with the identifiable frictions in the system, gravity's either there or not. And so typically this is kind of, this torque due to work is like an add-on torque that is just there because in a, in a machine tool, in a CNC, you've done all this stuff and now you have to push the tool into the steel to get it to cut. Well, was that friction? Not really. I mean, it kind of could be modeled as friction. You could probably come up with a number that way, but it's not really, you need an extra, six pounds of thrust to force that bit into the steel to make it cut. That's not gravity, it's not acceleration, so there's an additional term that you need to do there. What happens a lot of times is people will focus on that and forget about, oh yeah, we gotta move the inertias. Or they'll focus on the main one, oh, it's, it's, it, we gotta move this thing up and down. Well, it's easy to calculate, you know, uh, MGH and MB square or one half M, M, yeah, one half MV squared, yeah, that one. Um, you know, you get focused on the one and you forget that you've got these other things that you gotta do along the way. So all I'm telling you is when you're doing motorcycling, you've gotta go through each one of these and, and write the formulas for them. But these three aren't that hard, that's the hard one. I have a question about terminology. Yeah, go for it. So uh, my project was using a gated sorting system we're trying to so avoid get a gated what a uh, sorting system okay and i'm trying to avoid the use of pneumatic cylinders to actuate a gate yeah um so what type of mechanical system would you call it if you use like a motor with a pivot arm to open and close the gate it might start to be like a, a cam system i'm not sure you have to call it something um i think that all you really need to do is as you lay it out on on paper and start to draw out the sketch of it is start defining where the forces are, where they're acting. And the tricky thing is if they're acting at differently at different parts of the motion, because you've got more mechanical advantage in some places than others, um, what you end up doing is ignoring most of the motion and you're really looking for worst case because you're only gonna put one motor on it. And so you really don't care about what the torque is usually all the way along. You only care about what is it at the worst case point. And generally you're going to find out, oh, well, that's when this and this are normal to each, you know, at 90 degrees, that's going to be the worst case. And everything else is easier than that. And what if you're talking about like a, like a spring, I guess, where it's like based on the position and like, how do you take that into account where like something like a, a force is changing throughout? Ooh, that's really good point. Um, so it's hard. It's really hard. That's it, if you'll ever hear me in 140, and maybe your 140 teacher did this too, way back in our first design class. One of the things, first things I said is designing with springs is hard. 
because the force changes. And the very first thing we did was we drew a linear motion profile. Well, if you're gonna have a constant acceleration, you have to have fairly constant force. If you have a variable force, you're gonna, against, all, against a fixed inertia, you're gonna have a variable acceleration, and there go your calculations. So, two things are kind of hard to design in. One is springs, pushing things around with springs um, as a force, and the second is electric solenoids are hard, or magnetic solenoids that have a different force depending on their stroke. Those are a similar, you know, when you're trying to get away from pneumatics and you, it's like, well, what else could we use? How about a little pneumat or a little magnetic um, solenoid that we apply current to it and it gives it a little linear motion, again, you know, short travel typically. The, the hard thing, to, if you're trying to do any sort of thing other than just bang, bang, point to point, if you're trying to do any sort of profile with acceleration, they're difficult because the force changes. So just beware of that. It's, it's going to be difficult to do. It's one of the good things about any of the motors that we're using. Electric motors have a really key thing. Um, I guess we could um, go back to that now. One, one of the things that happens when you use a motor is that for the most part, um, hold on, let me go to that page, this page right here. For the most part, um, one of the things, you'll notice that torque in this region, for a certain period of time, the torque was proportional. It didn't change throughout the speed. It was independent, which means that in the motor, torque was proportional to current. Current is something that you have great control over with an amplifier. You can program down to milliamps of current. So you can program a motor to have exactly the amount of torque you want and, and it's independent of the speed. It's one of the things that makes electric motors so great to use in, in um, electromagnetic or electromechanical systems is that you have very predictable torque over and it's independent of speed. So, you know, you think about a, a motor and if you put in that amount of current, you get that amount of torque out of it and you get a predictable response. Other thing, everything else being equal, you know, not the other things being changed, but it's going to do the same thing over and over. And so you often do have really good control when you, when you switch over to electric motors, which is why they're a thing in so many design, you know, why we don't use hydraulic and pneumatic very much. Pneumatic, you can get constant force throughout its range, um, but it's different one direction than the other because of the size of the, the piston. It's got drag, it's, you know, it's, it, it's got its own problems. It's got flow restriction problems. Um, they wear out. So, you know, you'll, there's a good reason where if you want to have a programmable, predictable system, you know, or autonomous or automatic or whatever you want to call it. At some point, it's a, it's a software program controlling your motion. Down in the bowels of it, you have to be able to control current, and that controlled current gets you a torque that you want. That's the key to the programming of all these, all these robotic devices is control of current. Good question. What else? Oh, I'm designing a treadmill, which means that my loading is going to be very cyclic. Um, bump, bump, every, every, yeah, okay. So, uh, one approach actually that's used in normal treadmills is they include a flywheel to sort of smooth out those spikes in loading. Yep. Um, how much of that can be accomplished, like electronically? A hundred percent of it. Think, th think of it this way. The, if you are looking at a servo loop, the response rate to a disturbance like that is, it's faster than you can even imagine. Um, the, the, even the most basic servo loops that we would put together now would have a response rate of around 125 microseconds. It's easy to have something 
look at the error in torque, look at the error in velocity, look at the error in position, uh, run it through a calculation and make adjustments to that current because that's essentially what you get to adjust is the current and that's the torque to hold it in place. Um, and that current can go from one amp to eight amp every 125 microseconds. It's incredible. <laughs> the only thing you've got to deal with in that is you do have inductance in your motors. And so anytime you have inductance, it's a delay element um, to, you know, a capacitor is a delay to voltage and inductor is a delay to current. And so you would, you would have mechanisms that screw things up and you would have inductance of the motor that, that slows things down a little bit. But the control part of it is faster than you can imagine. So uh, I, I think you could do a lot with direct control of, you know, of things you so I'm and the idea of this that you should be able to at least get started with a sketch get started writing some formulas and then bring it to me <laughs> I'll help you um, that's what's really gonna happen here is you get started with it get the sketch get your vectors as to what you think take your first stab at the writing the formulas that model that for each of these four terms right what, what are these? And then we'll deal with each of them individually. And that's really where you're gonna learn this, not from me telling you all about it, uh, but it's when you, when you do one. Let's go back quickly to motion profiles. I wanna kind of take you through what I usually do to do a motion profile. Um, so I'm on, if I'm on uh, the, I'm, I'm kind of looking at here, you know, the seven steps of sizing and selection. That's the, the thing that I have in front of me from the motor sizing handbook. And um, you'll see this, you know, step one is develop the formulas, uh, like we just talked about. Try and get the, the formulas written, and now we're starting to start to put numbers into them. So let's deal with motion profiles. So uh, what, what basically I do is in this motion profile, there's a couple different kinds of profiles. If you're doing a motion that stops and or starts and then stops. So the first easiest one to analyze, the first easiest one with kinematic formulas to do is triangular. So triangular, you've got um, a max, a time of the move you have Oh, I don't do that. Um, a time to accelerate. You have, uh, let's see, you have a distance to accelerate and then you have an overall distance. These are my kind of the terms that I, I apply to it. And lastly, you have over here, if this is speed versus time, sorry about that, you have, um, the max. And these are the same terms that you would put into a kinematic formula. Nothing special here. I'm not making any of this up. This is just a particular case. Um, and you could either analyze half the triangle or the whole triangle. Kinematics analyzes, kinematic formulas analyze half the triangle. But your customer, when you go to ask them questions about what does their motion look like, they're gonna generally give you two terms. They're gonna give you um, XM and they're gonna give you TM. We need to move this far and this fast. We need to move from tree A to tree B, which is 22 feet in eight seconds. Now, I think that was one of you, one of you was working on the, right? Oh, that's just what they tend to know. They tend to know those two terms the most. What we really want to solve for right off the bat is you want to know what's the maximum velocity in this move because ultimately if you're going to solve TA is I alpha, we need to know alpha. Well, the way to find out alpha is that Vmax 
and T sub A. So I wrote down, it, it, it turns out mathematically, it doesn't matter if you math, do half the triangle or the full triangle, it's the same exact V max and triangular move is either two X M over T M or two times X sub A over T sub A. It doesn't make, it doesn't look right to me either. <laughs> they should be the same, but I've checked it. <laughs> it's, and you've checked it and it's the same. So first thing you do is run a just quick test. How fast is this motor gonna go? How fast is this slow? If you wanted to go, um, if X is 22 feet and it needs to be um, eight seconds, right? Well, that's 44 divided by eight. So roughly, what's that? Uh, five, uh, about, about five and a half feet per second is your Vmax. Make sense? There you go. Now you know how fast, that's the maximum speed you get that thing has to reach to do that move. It's, it's easy to get this. And from here then, alpha is V max over T sub A. Done. Got that number. That's ready to plug in. All right? So the only, the only tricky part is what happens when you have a trapezoidal move? It's a, the math is not right. So trapezoidal is, looks like this, where you're gonna accelerate for some period of time, but probably you can't really reach your, you can't go five. You can go four feet per second with this machine. So trapezoidal, or we're gonna run a longer distance so that at some point, it's, it's like if I did a triangular move on, on driving from, um, Chico to LA and you did it as a triangle of move, <laughs> you'd be going a little fast. So the, the move when you drive to LA is a trapezoidal move. You ramp up to speed, you accelerate up to speed, but then you stay at that speed for some, some amount of time, right? So the formula changes. Now, the, if you, the trouble here is th this is where kind of my little equation I'm gonna give you. All of a sudden, what we really care about if we're gonna do this move is we don't care so much about this part because that's really not where we're applying. We're kind of not applying, we don't need acceleration torque. We just need torque to overcome friction um, or gravity. So we don't really care about that. What you really care about is this section of it but the customer still gives you X. You know, they still give you overall X and they still give you overall T sub M. So you gotta come up with some ways to form this trapezoid. And what, the, what I'm gonna give you is a way to find out if, if you're doing, a, if you tried first a trapezo or triangular move to LA, and you determined, oh, that's too fast. I'm <laughs> going 180 miles an hour and that's not gonna work. Um, probably more than that actually. So now you know if 180 is too fast or if 5.5 feet per second, that's too, you know, that's too fast. We can't have a machine running through the field that fast, that's undangerous. Oh, why is it too fast? It's too fast because it's not safe. It's too fast because the mechanisms can't go that much. It's too fast because you're gonna get pulled over. We don't really care why it's too fast. It's just too fast. Okay, well, if that, the cool thing is if you know what's too fast, you automatically know one other thing. What do you know? You know what's not too fast. So all of a sudden, you know Vm is known. You know this now. As soon as you, if you're doing a trapezoidal move, you already tried triangular, decided it was too fast, and you know why. Therefore, you know what's too fast. So what are you gonna set it at out in the field? Is four and a half the right number? Is three and a half the right number? 
So therefore, we can rewrite our formula because the one thing you want to try and do is you want to try to, we're looking for something to minimize alpha. That's a goal, that's a design goal. Because if you minimize alpha, thus minimize torque to accelerate. And that's a good thing. That's what you're, you're always trying to minimize the torque it takes to do. That makes smaller motors, less expensive motors, smaller mechanisms, smaller breaker boxes, smaller everything. If you can minimize acceleration, that's a definite design goal. So uh, we're gonna, I'm, I, I solved some equations and some unknowns at one point way, way back. And I said, okay, I wanna solve for then something that gives me minimum acceleration and I know, what do I know? And it turns out this formula is T sub M minus X over V max, X M over V max. Um, and so what you end up solving for then is that's what you solve for T, T A. And once you have, now you have V max, you have T A, alpha is V max, over TA, and now, you, now you've got alpha again, and that's your goal. You're trying to get alpha from the motion profiles, okay? And it's likely minimized. There's a couple other profiles that you may come across that are actually, you know, you don't probably do a, a linear profile. The only reason we're doing linear profiles is because they are easy to program into a microcontroller, a motion controller, whatever it is, it's easy math because it's all linear stuff. But there are other profiles that are better, that are more efficient um, for a couple, re couple reasons. Let me, let me cover those. There's a profile called, um, oops, let me um, back, an S-curve. An S-curve profile is used where you don't wanna shake things up. This is when your um, grandma gets in the car and all of a sudden you don't really want to shake up grandma. So you do a profile as you accelerate, you do profile that looks more like this. And now all of a sudden you have one additional term, that, that additional term beyond acceleration as you have a changing acceleration and the changing acceleration is the, you know, the jerk, remember that? I don't know if you, you, get, you guys get that somewhere. So. Um, so the trouble with this one is your kinematic formulas are out the window in terms of distance, velocity, acceleration rate. Uh, so this ends up being more of a approximation. And then, um, as you get, as you pro, you know, a estimation and buying more motor than you need, because this is easy, but the trouble with this one is you need the most acceleration at the highest speeds. And we know that torque is um, speed, right, times what? Oh, I'm sorry, power. Um, I'm getting our torque times speed. There we go. Right. So as you increase the torque at high speed, what that makes is you made you buy a lot more power or use a lot more power or use a lot more and, and power um, back to, you know, energy. Because at some point it would be nice to design machines that take less energy rather than more energy. Right even though most people, the loads are generally so small that we really don't pay that much attention to it. But all else being equal, let's minimize how much energy the machine takes. Well, energy, you know, uh, power is energy per time, right? So if we wanna minimize the amount of energy, we start having to work backwards. And we, we do wanna minimize the amount of power, which means you don't want to have your most acceleration at the highest speed. So that brings up another kind, parabolic, 
which happens to be the most energy efficient um, profile. That one looks more like that. So now your highest acceleration is down here. And as you get higher and higher speed, your acceleration drops. Perfect. Trouble? Uh, how do you calculate, you know, that speed, torque, um, distance versus time? What, you know, this is, this is a much harder thing to put into a microcontroller and ask it to produce a changing profile over time. But there are controllers that already have this built into them, but they cost an extra thousand dollars. If you're dealing with a large motor, and energy is really a big deal because it's a five kilowatt motor and five kilowatts over a year or two is going to really start to add up. That thousand dollars that you paid extra in time or in components to get a parabolic profile may easily pay off in energy savings. Okay, I'll just throw those out there. They're not very common at all. It's triangular and trapezoidal. Those are the ones we get to, okay?